session and we are so that's wonderful great so uh welcome and good afternoon everybody to accessible technology services webinar series on video accessibility my name is gaby de young and i'm a member of the it accessibility team and today terrell thompson and i are going to present uh, several topics on <clears throat> excuse me video accessibility um, including captioning, audio description, and accessible media players, just to name a few. So we've got a lot of content to cover this afternoon, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so when we, uh, when we think about accessible video, we think about who will be impacted by inaccessible video. Certainly users who are deaf, hard of hearing, or are otherwise unable to hear audio will be impacted. And the solution to this is to provide captions. Um, and this is an easier task to do than one might think. And it's an available option in many video platforms. And in a bit, I'll go over steps for captioning video in Zoom, Panopto, and YouTube. Others who will be in, uh, impacted by inaccessible video include users who are blind, and have a visual impairment or are otherwise unable to see video, the solution for this barrier is to provide audio description. And Terrell's gonna talk uh, a, a little bit later on about audio description um, and offer some solutions later on in the presentation. Users who are deaf and blind and are unable to hear and see the audio and video will also be impacted. Um, the solution for this is to provide a scram a, a transcript rather and used users uh, will most likely consume this information using a refreshable braille display and a screen reader to access the text transcripts are, are great and useful for searching keywords and allow users to jump to specific sections of a recording based on that search there are other examples of individuals impacted by inaccessible video, including folks who don't use a mouse, they only use a keyboard to navigate, or speech input to dictate documents or to navigate and control systems. And other examples include uh, individuals that use screen readers to access information and navigate, or individuals uh, with low vision um, and depend on high contrast or a, a custom color scheme. And solutions to these barriers would be to provide an accessible media player that can offer captions in multiple languages, audio description, ASL interpretation, control of rate and speed, as well as other customizable options. And Tara's going to talk more uh, later about accessible media players, uh, an accessible media player that was developed uh, here at the UW. And just for clarification, we wanted to make sure we presented the differences between the accessibility offices and responsibility when it comes to accessible video. If an individual has requested an accommodation, disability resources for students will provide funding and support for captioning and audio description for course materials for students. And disability services office will provide those services for faculty, staff, and visitors to the University of Washington. Uh, assistive Technology Services provides internal grant funding for captioning high impact videos in a proactive manner. And we also provide training and support for UW departments with regards to accessible IT rather. And I'll talk more about the grant funded captioning service more in depth as we get into captioning. So more about captioning and hopefully we have captions uh, turned on uh, for this um, presentation as well. So how to caption videos. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk about captioning and show you techniques for enabling automatic speech recognition in Zoom, Panopto and YouTube. Um, and it's important to notice that automatic speech recognition captions or ASR uh, they may not be accurate enough to serve as an accommodation for people who depend on captions. Although the accuracy may be really high, they lack the ability to convey context of what is happening in the meeting and can often mislabel speakers. Also, technical 
medical, legal, and other specialized terms are not often automatically transcribed accurately. However, with that said, Zoom's ASR is really, really good. And in some situations, individuals prefer Zoom, the automatic Zoom captioning over hum ca human captioning. So it may be appropriate to reach out to individuals who request accommodations and ask uh, if automatic captioning is acceptable. If they say yes, then you're good to go. But if they say no, then you should make arrangements to hire a human captioner. And I'll also, sh also show you tips for editing caption files using caption editors. So let's go over uh, some steps in Zoom first. It is possible to have live automatically generated captions for your meeting or webinar, depending upon the type of Zoom account that you have. And we're gonna go over how to make sure that you have the correct settings enabled for displaying captions for webinars or meetings. But keep in mind that these settings do need to be configured well in advance before your meeting or webinar. And you'll need to make sure that you're logged into your Zoom account um, through your web browser rather than through, uh, through the, the Zoom client itself. And uh, this slide shows where to find the settings for cloud captioning. So when you're logged into your account from a web browser, um, you wanna select, <clears throat> excuse me, you wanna select settings um, from the left-hand navigation menu. And from the meeting tab, you wanna click on in meeting advance to expose those controls. And if you scroll down to the bottom there a little bit, you'll see a toggle switch for closed captioning. If you, you want to make sure that you turn that on and select the checkbox for enabling live transcriptions to appear um, in the side panel of the Zoom window. And you also want to make sure that you toggle on save captions, which allows participants to save the transcripts to their local computer. Uh, now, performing these steps only enables captions to appear during the live Zoom meeting. It doesn't allow for uh, uh, captions to be saved to the Zoom cloud recording. So there, there are some extra steps for that. So if you want to save your captions um, uh, in the Zoom cloud recording, you have to enable, enable Zoom audio transcription. And to do this, when you're in your Zoom account, um, you want to select the recording tab and click on the checkbox that says audio transcript. And this will automatically transcribe the audio of a meeting or webinar that you record to the cloud. Now, one of the disadvantages of ca uh, captioning is that it's not, uh, um, it, uh, it breaks off when you go into breakout rooms. So you do have to restart um, that captioning again. Um, and if you do have somebody who has uh, requested an accommodation um, and you're anticipating breakout rooms, you know, you're only going to have one um, captioner available. So if you have two people who need uh, captions for the breakout room, you're going to need to make sure that you have two captioners who can follow each one of those uh, individuals into the, the breakout room. Okay, so now that you've got all of your settings all set, then you'll need to turn on the captions uh, in your Zoom meeting or webinar. And to do that, um, on the Zoom toolbar, you'll see a live transcript button. It's only visible to you as the meeting host. And if you click on that icon, then, uh, then this little pop-up window appears that's uh, shown on this slide here. And then from this point, you can select Enable Auto Transcription. And incidentally, these are the same steps that you would take if someone had requested an accommodation and you needed to assign third party access for a human captioner. Excuse me. If you uh, decide to record your session, you'll be presented with options, either save locally or save to the cloud. Excuse me. And you want to make sure uh, that you save to the cloud as that will give you access to the transcript and you can make changes later on if necessary. Okay, um, let's see. So once your meeting or webinar has ended, it will take quite a bit of time for the recording to be saved to the cloud. When that process is complete, you should receive an email from Zoom with the link to the recording. 
and clicking on that link within the email will prompt you to log into your Zoom account in a web browser and will take, take you directly to uh, the cloud recording. And this slide shows you the account page that the link will take you to. Now, I want to I want to point something out there. Notice in the lower left hand corner, I've got a little arrow pointing there. Um, and you can see that the audio transcript is still being processed. And what this means is that even though the recording is complete, the transcript is not yet complete. It's process of saving to the cloud. And it takes a long time for the transcript to automatically upload. But when that process is complete, you'll receive an other, another email from Zoom notifying you that the audio transcript is available. So you can click on that link within that email and that'll take you to the same page, but this time it will show you the file size of the audio and in this case, it's probably two megabytes. So um, if you click on that, uh, then, uh, then you're able to just click on the play button um, in the center of that uh, film icon there. Uh, and then that will open up the recording in a new browser window and give you the ability to edit the transcript. So the video portion takes center stage with captions just below the video and the transcript appears popped out to the right hand side there. And this slide shows a screenshot of that cloud recording with the closed captioning and audio transcript revealed. Now it's possible to edit the audio transcript just by hovering your mouse over those little text balloons until a little pencil icon appears. And you can see it here on this slide. I've, I've um, surrounded it in a, in a red square. And uh, that'll show up in the lower right hand corner of the text bubble. And when you click on that little pencil icon, that text bubble turns into an editable text field where you're able to uh, make changes to the content. And once you're satisfied with that, with your changes, you have the option to either uh, select a check mark and save your changes, or you can select the X and reject your changes and go back to the original text that was already there. Now, making changes uh, in this way only changes the transcript. It actually doesn't change the captions. Can I uh, interrupt, Gaby? Yeah, sure, go ahead. We, we have a, uh, a teaching moment um, of our own here that we, a, a few slides ago, you sort of walked everybody through the process of how to enable captions um, within a Zoom meeting. And here in this particular Zoom meeting, I'm host and I've been following those exact procedures. And when I get to the next slide, I'll fast forward, there you go. Um, I click CC, I see exactly what's shown here on this slide, but when I click, and when, when I click enable auto transcription, I get a message that says automatic transcription is now on, but it doesn't actually seem to be on. So it seems to be broken at the moment. And, and so we're going to do some live troubleshooting. Um, and this will be great for everybody, I think. This is the first time I've ever experienced this. It has always been reliable from my experience. Um, so maybe there's something happening or it could be something wrong with my Zoom client. So I'm going to make Anna Marie host. And she is then um, going to make me co-host so I don't lose all my privileges, <laughs> or I only lose them temporarily. Um, but then she can uh, test and see if she, if she can turn on captions. And if she can, then it's a problem with my Zoom client. If not, then it's a problem somewhere further upstream. So, so anyway, we'll explore that. And if captions get enabled, you'll, you'll know what the outcome was. And if not, you'll know what the outcome was. Unfortunately, nobody in registering, nobody said they actually needed captions. So, um, so it's not, um, and this, this is, you know, yet another reason why it's important to have human captionists. If you actually have somebody who needs captions as an accommodation, computers don't always behave as you, you think they will. Okay, great. So we're kind of working on that in the background, it sounds like. Okay, so let's go ahead and fast forward. Oops, I fast forwarded too far. So let's talk about um, enabling captions, <clears throat> excuse me, in Panopto cloud recordings. 
So this slide shows you how you can enable your captions in your Panopto cloud recordings. Um, when you're signed into your Panopto account, make sure that you're in the My Folder view. And from here, you'll want to click on the gear icon that's located in the upper right hand corner of the window. And you can see I have a little arrow that's pointing to that gear. Um, and that will open up an overview window. It'll just give you just fairly basic information. Um, but you want to select the settings item on the, in the left hand navigation menu and this will display more options and if you scroll down a little bit you can see that there are uh, there's an options for uh, captions that has a drop down menu so from the drop down menu you want to select automatic machine captions uh, and then that will <clears throat> excuse me that will automatically generate um, captions when you save your Panopto recordings to the cloud. And just to, to save from here, all you have to do is just exit out of, of this window. So once your Panopto video has completed saving to the cloud, you, you'll be able to edit the captions within Panopto. You can go back to my My Folder view and you'll see a list um, of the videos that you have saved in the cloud. Just select the video that you'd like to review and this will result in the video opening up in a new web page in the Panopto caption editor, which is what we see here on this slide. Now, in the upper right hand corner, you'll notice uh, there's a pencil icon and I've placed a red square around that icon to easily identify it. When you select that icon, it will allow you to edit the captions in the caption editor. However, you need to perform one more step to make things a little bit easy on yourself. Um, on the left hand navigation menu, you need to select captions. Um, and I've um, enclosed that in, in a red box as well. And this will display the captions and the timestamp that you see showing up to the left of the video preview window. And from here, you're able to do a variety of things. Most importantly, you can edit the transcript uh, quite easily. You can also see the waveform, which um, is below the video portion. Um, so that's the waveform of the audio, which can make it a little bit easier to line up the tan uh, timestamps of the audio. And also you can see when the slides are introduced along the waveform during the presentation. So once you've made your changes and you're satisfied with, uh, with the changes that you made, you can go ahead and select the apply button at the top of the window and this will update the transcript and will be reflected in the captions that appear when the video is played. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, editing captions in YouTube. When you're uploading your videos to YouTube, captions are automatically generated using ASR. So you don't really have to change any of your settings within YouTube in order for this to happen. It just happens automatically when you upload. And this slide, <clears throat> excuse me, shows a screenshot of videos uh, that were uploaded to my YouTube account. Um, and at the very bottom, uh, is uh, my, my, my original video, the original video that I had uploaded to uh, my YouTube instance. Um, the other item um, above it, I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but I want to point out there on the, the right hand column there, you can see link text that says duplicate and edit. And when you first upload your video, that link will say add, A-D-D. Now, remember in Zoom, it takes a long time for videos to be saved to the cloud, and it takes an even longer time for the transcripts to be saved to the cloud. Well, the same thing is true for YouTube as well. So if you click on that link when it says add, that will allow you to start typing and create a transcript from scratch. Or you can just wait until that, uh, that text has changed to duplicate and edit um, and then you'll be able to go ahead and um, edit the transcript that was automatically created. So clicking on that duplicate and edit link will open up the video in the caption editor, as we see here on this slide. And there's one modification that you need to make in order to get, uh, get it to this particular view where you can see the transcript and the timestamps. 
So if you look at the upper middle column here, you're going to see, uh, you'll notice a, uh, more link text that says edit as text. When you first open up uh, the video in this view, um, this left one will show a block of text with, with no formatting and no timestamps. It's just, just pure text. And the link in this middle column will say assign timings instead of edit as text. When you click on that uh, uh, link text that says assign timings, <clears throat> then it changes to this view where you can see text bubbles <clears throat> and the start and stop times of when the text will be presented on screen. Excuse me. And in the window just below the video, uh, again, you're able to see the waveforms of the audio. And just above those audio waveforms are blocks of text. And you can click on these uh, blocks of text and slide the blocks um, just slightly left or right um, to move the timings ever so slightly. And it's really easy to do. So uh, makes uh, makes editing a lot, lot easier. So when you're working on your captions, you wanna make sure that you save your draft um, and that as this will allow you to come back and work on the video at another time. Um, and when you do that, this working draft appears in your video list as a duplicate of the original video that we saw in the previous slide. So when you're satisfied with your changes, you can select the publish button and that will update the changes and issue them immediately. So what do you do when the automated captions are too bad to be edited, which can happen sometimes. Accessible technology services will caption a limited number of UW video presentations without charge through a captioning service supported by UWIT. And folks are encouraged to apply for funding to caption highly visible, high impact, multiple use strategic videos that are used several times in a course um, or have a lot of very important information. And I've included a link uh, for this service at the end of the, this presentation on the resources slide in case you wanna learn more about that. For other videos, you might wanna consider using the state contract with 3Play Media. The University of Washington has a contract with 3Play 3, 3, 3 Media for captioning services and provides integration with YouTube Panopto and other platforms as well. And I've included a link for that on our resource slide too. So this slide shows the different caption file options offered by 3Play Media, uh, DFXP, SMIL, SRT, WebVTT. These are all standard file types used by popular media players. However, the format for each one of these file types is gonna be slightly different. So the takeaway from this slide is that it's important to know which file format your video player supports, as that's going to determine the type of file that you choose. And this slide just shows us a format of a WebTT caption file. You can see it's just plain text with a timestamp associated with the, when the text will appear on screen. It's got a couple of uh, dashes there and a, and a bracket. Um, and you can edit these files just using a really simple plain text editor, such as Notepad. You don't really need a fancy caption editor to adjust the captions, but it certainly makes things a lot easier. Um, caution though, when you, if you are um, editing these types of files in something like Note, Notepad, um, you know, it's very easy to make simple mistakes such as entering a wrong number or uh, having an additional space or using a, a semicolon instead of a period. And that can really compromise your, um, uh, your uh, uh, captions. So you wanna be very careful about that. So there are um, other caption editors available um, that are free. Uh, Amara is one of them, uh, dot sub and subtitle horse is another one. So which videos have the highest priority when you're considering captions? Well, certainly videos that are required viewing for individuals who need an accommodation would be high priority for captioning, but also videos that are likely to be required viewing for individuals who need an accommodation should also be considered. So you're thinking ahead about uh, what the needs may be. 
Other videos to consider include ones that are popular and viewed a lot, videos that are relatively new, uh, and captioning should be part of the workflow, um, and videos that provide critical content. So how do you prioritize your videos for captioning? I'm actually going to hand it over to Terrell, and he is going to talk more about that. Thanks, Gaby. Let me uh, share my screen. <clears throat> I think uh, actually I'm going to share my entire desktop because I've got um, a browser window to share as well as um, PowerPoints. Um, so in the, the browser window, um, this is a tool that we created called YouTube Caption Auditor, YTCA, or that's the tool behind this website. And uh, there are 88 known YouTube channels at the University of Washington. Um, I think uh, there, there are probably others that we don't know about. And we're able to use this tool to engage with the YouTube data API. And, um, and then that returns all sorts of data about the videos on, on the, the known channels. All we have to do is feed it a channel ID, and then it gives us uh, a bunch of data. And so that's enabled us to create this table that sort of compares YouTube channels um, on you know, how, how many videos they have and how much captioning they're doing of those videos, among other things. There's a lot of data here about uh, traffic and so forth. Um, the, the red channels are uh, the channels you don't want to be. Those are the ones that haven't done any captioning. The green channels have captioned 50% or more of their videos, and the white channels are, are somewhere in between. So um, uh, you want to be a green channel. And as we see down at the bottom, overall performance, um, 29, or 29 of the channels, the 33% are green channels, those are the ones that are doing well. Um, and only five channels have not yet started. So that actually is, is pretty good. And the overall um, 43.2 percent. That's the overall uh, percentage of videos out of all 88 channels out of 10,000 videos. 43.2 percent of those have been captioned. And since we actually started tracking this just a few years ago, we started at seven percent. So, uh, so this is growing. It, it's wonderful. Um, we're glad to see it's growing, but we still 43.2 you know, percent could obviously be, um, be better. So this is uh, behind a UW Net ID, and it's only um, accessible to in specific individuals who have been granted access. But if you are a person who owns a YouTube channel or has some influence over your departmental YouTube channel, then um, just let me know. TFT is my UW Net ID and my email, um, and I can uh, grant you access. The other thing, in addition to sort of comparing where you are relative to other um, YouTube channels, you can look at um, details about your channel. I'm going to pick on the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering because they actually are doing pretty good. Um, but you get kind of a summary overview at the top. But then what is really helpful for prioritization is you see all your videos. So they have 22 videos. And you can sort this table by any of the columns. So by default, it's sorted by uh, al alphabetically. But a, a good way to prioritize might be views. And so if we click on views and look at the largest, the most views first, we see that there's a video called What is Neural Engineering that is by far their most popular. It's got over 6,000 views. And it actually hasn't been captioned. So it's an older video, so we might want to consider, you know, date and views together as we're prioritizing. But certainly, a video, their most popular video, even if it's older, should be captioned, and so that would be probably their top priority. You know, the one that they should focus on. As we look then down through the list, sorted by views, we see that there are just a couple of others within the list. Actually, this is the entire list, so only three videos total. That haven't been captioned um, and so so that would be really easy to, to just knock those three out um, but certainly starting with the one that gets the most views and then you know if you got more videos in 22 and more to caption and you need to sort of prioritize then i would suggest some combination of views and and date um, 
using this tool. But once again, just let me know if um, you want access to this and I'll be happy to, uh, to provide that. And feel free to spread the word too. This can be a really useful tool for, for prioritizing. So I wanna talk about uh, audio description. Um, and actually maybe I should pause before we do that because this is a quite a break in uh, topics, um, very different sort of topic than captioning. Um, are there questions for Gaby about captioning before we proceed with audio description? Feel free to either type a question in chat or if you just have, if you just want to unmute un un and, and ask, I think we're a small enough group we could do that too. Terrell, I just wanted to point out that Sarah Wood um, <clears throat> uh, uh, said in chat that um, captioning is not available for Zoom for the School of Medicine. Um, so uh, due to HIPAA, uh, uh, concerns. So I uh, just wanted to, to point that out. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. And also, I think you, you mentioned, um, but in case you didn't, it's also not available in breakout rooms, right? Right. Okay. Sounds like no, no other questions about captions. Okay. So, um, if we consider these sort of siblings, you've got captions and you've got audio description. Captions, although they benefit a lot of people, um, they um, you have one, one group in terms of accessibility and disability, uh, people who are deaf or hard of hearing need captions because they can't hear the, um, the audio. Audio description is for people that can't see the video. So it's two different groups, two different user groups, and two different features that benefit those groups. So when somebody can't see the video, then often they can understand the video just by listening to its audio. But the question is, is there anything in this video that you have that is not understandable because it's visual only? So when you get visual only information, then that information somehow needs to be conveyed to people that can't see it. And that, you know, primarily we're talking about people who are blind, maybe people who are low vision, um, but it could also be somebody who's sort of watching the video, but they're actually doing other things. So this happens often where, you know, you, you've got a video, you know, that you're trying to catch up on, trying to learn from whatever, but you also have work to do. And so, so the video is sort of peripheral, maybe even on a side monitor, maybe even in another room. Um, and you need to be able to access that content. Um, so audio description is a, a one of the terms by which this feature is known, um, but it, sometimes it goes by other things like descriptive video or description or um, video description. So that can be a little bit confusing, but probably if it has the word description in it, then we're talking about the same thing. It basically is a separate narration track that verbally describes key visual content. Well, there's another phrase here on the slide that we're gonna talk quite a bit about. And so this is important and that is extended audio description. And that is the way audio description works is you've got a video and you have something that needs to be described because otherwise the video you know, has some inaccessible content to people that can't see it. And so that description needs to be inserted into the video. And there are different ways of doing that, which we'll talk about. But some videos have so much spoken audio that there's really no place for the description to be inserted. And so what needs to happen then is the the video needs to pause while the description happens, and then it needs to resume after, after the description is over. So that process of having extended audio description is when you pause the video in order to describe something and then resume playback. So, and there are different ways of doing that. So what we wanna talk about during this segment is, is once again, prioritizing determining which videos are most in need of audio description because they aren't all the same. Um, some, some require audio description more than others. 
And then we're going to talk about how to actually do this. Um, we're going to present three, maybe four, depending on how you count them, approaches to audio description. And also avoiding the need altogether for audio description. So on prioritization, it basically is the same as captioning. Um, you know, you look at, at your views, you look at um, the publication date, same, you could use YTCA, although YTCA reports from YouTube on whether a video is captioned or not, so you get that yes, no field. Um, it doesn't know which videos have been audio described, so it can't help with that, but it can help with prioritization because you can see which videos have you know, the most traffic and, and their publication date, and you can use that table and then you know, click on the, the name of the video and that actually opens the video on YouTube. So you can then watch the video and see um, if this needs description or not. Uh, the other um, item here in, in prioritization on this slide is audience demographics. If you know that there are you know, people with disabilities or people who particularly would need audio description in your audience, um, then that would be something where you, you certainly would want to focus um, on getting those videos described. Um, beyond that, basically the idea is, you know, watch the video with your eyes closed or just imagine, you know, if somebody is watching this and they can't see the visuals, then what are they missing? What are the important details? Um, and I'd like to, to sort of break it down into three priority levels. A high priority need for description is when nothing makes sense with audio alone. Um, medium priority is if the video is generally understandable, just listening to the audio, but there are some critical details that are lost. And a low priority is when some information is lost, but it's probably not critical information in the great scheme of things. So I've got a few videos um, that I wanted to show and we can just think about uh, what, which of those three priorities is this particular video. So let's start with um, Together We Will. I think that's here. Um, so this is on the, uh, the UW, UW's uh, channel. So let's just watch a little bit of this. Oh, and I apologize, I forgot to turn on my audio. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to stop share. I'm going to share again, but I'm going to share sound this time. So you actually will hear what's in my headphones. So I think the answer is obvious here. Um, those of you who are able to see this video get a lot more out of it than those that don't. Those that can't see it, um, this is just a music video. It's some very nice music, um, but not um, no message here other than there's some music. So this is a high need for audio description. Um, Let's look at, this is actually a similar video. This is the best of UW 2016. This is on the president's blog. So we could, we could go on and on with that. Um, obviously, the same as the, the Together We Will video, it's all music. There's actually no spoken content or nothing that's narrated, nothing that's verbalized. It's just on-screen either images or on-screen text. Both of these videos had on-screen text, but that's not accessible to somebody that can't see it. Um, but this, this video is different than the other um, in that there actually is this link underneath it. it says video is also available with audio description so you can follow that link and that takes you to youtube and watch them the same video um, but this is the audio described version words appear 
Hashtag Best of UW 2016, the Nobel Medal next to David J. Tholis. 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics with President Obama, Mary Claire King, National Medal of Science, UW and Microsoft break record for DNA data storage. A collage of photos, inaugural Husky 100. Inaugural Parents and Family Weekend. So obviously this version is much more accessible than, um, than the, the one that has no audio description. So you can see how audio description is, uh, is important. Also, um, you know, as you listen to that, notice the sort of the quality of the audio description um, that this is you know, voiceover talent it's an actor reading reading the text and you're reading the script there's actually it's mostly on screen text but there are a few other details um like president obama appeared in a scene and and, he, and the, the voice actually you know says president obama um whereas there's no on-screen text that says that um but also you know just that that human narration, the quality of that, as it you know, sort of fits with the music, um, you know, can be important in some contexts. But uh, depending on uh, how uh, how important that is, there are other ways um, to do audio description. It doesn't have to be human narration. So we're going to talk about that as we get into the how-to section. Um, let's look at another example. This is IT accessibility what campus leaders have to say. This is a video that we put together a few years ago. Obviously it was when Michael K. Young was still president of the university. Um, but let's watch a little bit of this. Again, ask that same question, is this accessible to somebody that can't see it or are there some important missing details? We are committed to the notion that everyone should have an opportunity to participate in higher education, whether it be from the learning perspective or the research perspective or an opportunity to work here at this institution. Uh, we benefit from that because we get to enjoy the talents uh, and the skills of those people who come in and also their perspective, which in many cases will be different from the perspective of others on campus. So what, um, what do you think? Um, Feel free to, to just shout out an answer. Is, is this a high priority need, a medium priority, or a low priority? And why? Any volunteers? <laughs> Okay, I'll just tell you. Um, this, this, I would say, is a medium priority. You can hear what the person is saying, but it is just a person. And so why, why should we care whether this person thinks IT accessibility is important? It really is significant that this is Michael K. Young, president of the University of Washington. And actually throughout this, the entire video is a montage of um, presidents and CIOs and high high level you know people at universities around the country, and you don't know that you don't know who any of these people are as they're talking about IT accessibility. Visual visually, you see an on screen graphic that identifies them, but that information is missing. So this is uh, critical information, and it actually um, because it is so um, isolated, just a little bit of information here, a little bit of information there. It actually could be a different technique. You don't necessarily need a human narrator to do that. There are other ways to do that. Um, let's watch one more example. This is a, another video that we produced called Teamwork, Making IT Accessibility Accessible at the University of Washington and Statewide. My name is Cheryl Bergstaller and I direct Accessible Technology Services at the University of Washington. And through our Access Technology Center and other services, we're making sure that the IT that we develop, the next person procure, and use at the University of Washington is accessible to either ourselves for our websites or with vendors if it's a commercial product. My name is Patrick Powell. I'm from University of Washington, Tacoma. My uh, responsibility is technology. I'm the vice chancellor for information technology. When I look 
So this is this is a case where this is really a low priority and actually even lower than low. It's a no priority. Um, we have avoided the need for audio description. The, otherwise, the only thing that would have needed to be described is that on-screen text that identifies who the person is who's speaking. But everybody who speaks in this video introduces themselves um, and, and includes not just their name, but their title and affiliation. So, um, so everything in this video is accessible. So there's no need at all for audio description in this case. So um, obviously, you know, some videos are critical than others um, for getting um, description. Now, how do you do this? What sort of methods are there for, for getting video described? One, you can hire a traditional audio description service provider. So that's what we heard uh, with the best of UW, the that um, human narration. Two, you can hire a captioning vendor. Uh, Davey talked about three play media that we have a, a captioning contract with. They also do audio description and as an add-on service. So we can uh, that's an option. Um, three, you can do it yourself using a time text file. Gaby also talked about the WebVTT file format um, that uh, can be used not just for captions, but also for descriptions. And four, this is a, the maybe, um, have, have students do it. And I'll talk about what I mean by that in a bit. So first of all, um, hire a traditional description provider. Um, there are some links here and um, the slides are gonna be available afterwards along with the recording. And so you'll be able to access these links directly. But on the, uh, on the accessible technology video accessibility page, there is a, a link to the American Council of the Blind's directory of audio description service providers. And there are nearly a hundred companies now that are in this business. And, but they, they vary in terms of the scope of the services they provide. Some are just for live description where they describe live sort of you know, theatrical events, that sort of thing. Um, some are only focused on really big production, you know, Hollywood type stuff, adding description there. And so we kind of narrowed the scope of that directory and we surveyed the companies that seemed to fit. And what we came up with in the end were seven providers that seemed to be uh, just to sort of fit the higher education need um, and that can do description in a timely fashion, just very small jobs compar comparatively and at an affordable cost. And so, so seven um, choices there. And those are all linked on the Making Video Accessible page. Um, the traditional providers do use professional voiceover talent. So they script the description, then they read the, the, the script, and then they professionally mix it so that you've got description content that is balanced really nicely with the program audio. So they may you know, duck the program audio a little bit while the description is happening and then bring it back up again. And it all flows really nicely together. Um, the typical deliverable, at least for us, is an audio described version of the video. So like with the president's blog, there's the non-described version on, you know, that's embedded on the blog, but then there's a link to the described version that, you know, is a separate video that has description mixed in. So that's typically the way this is delivered. And the typical price range is 10 to $15 um, per video minute. So and that it varies you know, between those seven providers. Um, but the prices are coming down quite a bit, largely because 3Play has entered this market and driven the price down, I think. Uh, the price also varies depending on complexity and extended audio description. If they have to pause the video while they're describing, then that tends to have a higher cost associated with it. Um, just uh, this example again, um, with the, or the video, wherever the video, the original video occurs, there should be a link then to the audio described version. That's the simplest way to deliver this. Um, although uh, the, the link to the audio described version should actually be above the video rather than below it. Because by now, you know, the person has already labored through watching the original video and discovering that it's not accessible. And then they continue on on the page and, and find that there actually was an audio description ver described version all along. 
and that can be a frustrating experience. So you know, put it above the video instead of below. Approach number two is to hire a captioning vendor. So again, three play media, uh, automatic sync, who also does the same kind of captioning work that three play does. Um, they both do audio description now. The cost is slightly less. Three play media charges seven dollars and fifty cents a minute um, for standard. Um, eleven dollars per minute if extended is needed, and and then the price goes up if you have expedited requests. Um, the one uh, gotcha. The, well, there are a few things that separate what they do. One is that captioning is required even if the video is already captioned. So that seems seems to me to be kind of an inefficiency. I don't need captions. I just need audio descriptions. But captioning is very tightly wedded as part of their process. So they depend on the timing of captions in order to figure out programmatically where they can inject description. And so that just, you know, they've got a really efficient description process that is built around captioning since what they did originally was captioning. So I've talked to them about trying about separating those and just offering audio, audio description as a separate service. Um, but at this point, they're not able to do that. So you actually that actually drives the price up a little bit because you do also have to pay for um, captioning, even if you don't need it. Um, the output also uses synthesized speech. So you're saving um, you know, on cost a little bit because they don't have human narrators um, who are, are you know, having to get paid to do this. Um, so whether synthesized speech is satisfactory to users, um, there actually has been quite a bit of research on that. And, uh, and the answer, it, it turns out, is depends on the context, that users are OK with the synthesized speech, particularly in academic content. But if it's a dramatic work, they, they're happy with any description they can get because there's not that much of it out there. But, uh, but they really prefer human narration if it's a dramatic work because a, synth a synthesized voice kind of gets in the way and distracts them you know, from the, the production. Um, so the deliverable, you know, there are lots of choices, but it can be the same, uh, just an audio described version with that synthesized voice mixed into the, uh, to the video. Um, I'm uh, getting a little low on time, so I'm going to kind of hurry through some of these slides, but I just have some slides showing what this looks like on the 3Play Media website, where you can choose whether you want extended or standard and what your uh, time frame is and and then it has the costs associated with that um, and then you've got because it's synthesized speech you have lots of choices in terms of the voices that you use um, and i can uh, if anybody ends up using three play media for their audio description then um, talk to me about this because we actually have some some research to support what the best choices are when it comes to a synthesized voice. And that too depends on your content. Um, and then there are lots of choices for output. Um, but again, the best approach, the best output, um, which just works everywhere, um, is to have a, just a separate described video and to link to both, you know, both versions from the other version. Approach number three is a WebVTT file, same file again. Uh, this looks like the slide that Gaby had up earlier that had you know, some caption text. But instead of caption text, you have description text. And the way this works is the browser reads that content um, and provides the audio description. So I want to uh, maybe get out of my slides here. I want to go back to. Um, this video, which actually does have WebVTT based description, I have to turn it on with the D button on the media player. And then I'll restart and um, you'll hear the description. This also has uh, extended description built in. So it will pause while the description happens and then it will automatically restart when the description is finished. So let's check it out. Michael K. Young, President, University of Washington. 
We are committed to the notion that everyone should have an opportunity to participate in higher education. Whether I'm going to speed Michael up a little perspective bit. Or the research perspective or he's not to work our president anymore, system. I feel like I can do this. Uh, we benefit from that because we get to enjoy the talents uh, and the skills of those people who come in and also their perspective, which in many cases will be different from the perspective of others on campus. So accessibility becomes a very important value at the university. I'm going to slow back down again. Images of a teacher and students in classrooms and at computer stations. Text moves on a closed circuit TV. Words appear. IT accessibility. What campus leaders have to say. Tracy Mitrano, Director of IT Policy, Cornell University. We're a leading university globally. We want the best talent. In so the nice thing about this approach is it's a WebVTT file. So it's super simple. And Gabby mentioned that you can do this in Notepad and it's easier to do it in a captioning tool. Um, but if you just have a few lines of description text, um, as in this video, it's, there's not that much that needs to be described. You can very easily do this in Notepad and in five minutes, you've got your description. The, the a, a catch though, is that you have to be using a supported, a media player that supports this. This is built into the HTML5 specification. So this is the way that the W3C envisions audio description to happen, um, but, uh, right now, Able Player is the only media player that supports it, and that is the player that, that, that we developed internally. It is free, it's open source, um, um, and, you know, and, and it's available as a, a WordPress plugin, a little bit rudimentary at the moment, but we're working on that, um, as well as a Drupal module. Um, so, so it's out there, and it, you know, it, it, this is what you're seeing now is Able Player. Um, so Web VTT description can be uh, a solution. Uh, the advantage is it's easy. It's built into the HTML5 spec. Only one video is needed. That's the nice thing too, that extended audio description happens automatically. So uh, whereas if you have a video that is, um, you know, it has audio, extended audio description mixed in, it's a longer video than the original video. So the durations don't match up, which means you have to get both videos captioned separately. Um, which can be uh, yeah, convenient and, and add to the cost, inconvenient and add to the cost. Um, another thing to consider though, is that audio description is an art, finding the right words to say that don't distract. You know, there actually is a technique to this that people spend uh, a lot of time um, training to become an audio describer. So, so I don't wanna say, you, know, you can just do, do audio description yourself, that um, you know, if it's more complex than just identifying the names of speakers and providing a little bit of description here, a little bit of description there, then it probably should be sent out to um, some, you know, the, to the professionals who do this kind of work. Um, option four is have students do it, and and I mention this because um, there is a group of students at the University of Washington. This arose out of an undergraduate course, an entrepreneur course. Um, they're calling themselves video eyes, but they are doing automatic audio description using AI, which is really an interesting concept. And I was skeptical at first, but I've been checking out some of the some of their work, and uh, I want to share this together. We will video, which I showed you at the beginning, um, but this is their version of that. So let's see what they can do with artificial intelligence. This is an extraordinary time. Now, more than ever, we all have a duty to look out for one another, for each other. Is most vulnerable. So pretty impressive stuff. Obviously in this case, they're, it's just using OCR. So it's reading on screen text. And that is a synthesized voice, but they've invested in, in one of the premium synthesized voices. So it really sounds pretty natural. Um, but they're, they're venturing beyond this and actually have some, some, uh, some other demos where they're able to identify, you know, what's happening on the screen and, you know, objects in the screen and um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting work that they're doing. And um, so, so that, you know, you never know what you're going to get when you ask students uh, for a solution. Um, that brings us to the 
Washington State Audio Description Project. This is a project that we have just launched. Um, and this is working with states, other state higher education institutions to get more video audio described. So we're providing the funding for this. Um, this is funded by the Do It Center, uh, which is part of our group, but we've got um, state of Washington money to, to do this project. Um, and it, um, the, the goal is to work with these partner institutions to get high priority videos described. And so we're gonna provide support. We're gonna be the liaison for the vendors and, um, and just see how much video we can describe uh, between now and the, the end of the fiscal year. Um, but the, so the University of Washington as a partner in this is one of the partners we want to caption or we want to describe our own videos in addition to their videos. And so uh, if you have videos that you would like to, you know, that you feel are high priority and should be described and would like to participate in this project, then just let me know. Here's my email. So it's two things you can let me know about. One is if you want to participate as a UW participant in this project. And the second thing is if you want access to the YTCA reports, so you can you know, use that tool to, to help prioritize with your um, captioning and description efforts. Um, the last slide we have here is uh, just a bunch of the links that we have talked about. Um, the, the most uh, important one is uw.edu slash accessibility slash video. That's a kind of our hub for accessible video information, and you can access everything else um, from that, that website. So I'll leave it at that. And um, we're pretty much out of time, but I'm happy to entertain questions for anybody that wants to stick around. We can run a little bit long, that's fine. I'm gonna stop share this so I can access chat a little easier. And if anybody, again, if anybody wants to um, unmute and just ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. There was a question earlier about captions. Did you see that in chat, Gabby? Yeah, I actually answered that in the chat. Okay. As well. Yep. Excellent. So, uh, Nancy wants to know I know you can provide specialized words to captioning services if you're captioning a video rather than a live script. Oh, is that a comment to an earlier? Or yeah, just answer to the question. Okay. Try and catch up. Sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. So this is I actually been talking with the, the that student team quite a bit and adding vocabulary is also an important thing for description. Um, you know, it's interesting, like um, the uh, the video um, that that was outsourced, the president's video, the best of UW 2016 that was outsourced. There were a few things in that outsourced description. I thought it, it went really well overall, but there are a few things that if it was an internal job, um, they, they would have referred to, you know, certain landmarks probably by their name, like, you know, Sozolo, um, and you know other other prominent sort of features of the UW landscape, as well as prominent people like the president. Um, they you know, they recognized President Obama, but they didn't recognize President Kelsey. So um, you know things like that. Um, you know uh, there there are benefits to being able to provide some context to an audio description uh, provider. And so, so with this AI-based solution, they actually are, are working on building that kind of thing in where you can upload some context of vocabulary or things that, that, that um, they should be looking for, that the engine should be looking for when doing the description. So that should be, it should be really interesting to see how that um, evolves. Okay, so... I think uh, that about does it. Again, uh, thank, thank you all for attending. Uh, the, the recording will be up uh, probably within the next week or two, as well as we still don't have the past recordings up yet, um, but we're, we're gonna get all these videos up at the same time along with the slides. So watch for those on the Accessible Technology website. And um, come again this time next month and we'll have another 
um, presentation. I forget actually what's on tap next time. Is it Hadi doing a screen reader, um, testing pages with screen reader? I think that might be the next one up. Yes, I believe that is correct. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks everybody for coming. I am going to stop the recording now.